Thank you for joining us. Up next is Simon Willison, a co-creator of Django, inventor and ticker, and presenter of the next talk on Instant Serverless APIs, powered by SQLite. <laughs> Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. I know there were some incredibly good talks in this slot, so it's, I, I feel honored that you, you chose to join me here. Um, so I have a bit of a confession, first of all. Um, I called this talk Instant Serverless APIs Powered by SQLite. I've actually submitted it to regional Python conferences under a different name, and it wasn't accepted. So for PyCon, I thought, sod it, I'm going to throw in a buzzword. I threw in the word serverless, and it got accepted. And so now I feel honor-bound to give you a definition of serverless that isn't complete claptrap. So um, <laughs> my preferred definition of serverless, the one that actually means something useful to me, is scale to zero, right? It's the idea that you only pay for the computing resources you use which means that you can, run a web serve, you can run a web application, and if no one visits it, it doesn't cost you any money. And as a inveterate tinkerer and somebody who loves churning off new side projects, this is a very useful capability to have. Um, and the, the serverless world got even more interesting this month with the release of Google Cloud Run. Um, this came out, I think, just at the beginning of April. And it's really fa it's a fascinating thing. It lets you define an application as a Docker container, and then Google will run it when it gets traffic and turn it off when it doesn't. So it should ideally be incredibly inexpensive, if not free, if you're not getting a lot of, a lot of hits. Um, but if you look at the, def at the web page about Google Cloud Run, it does say stateless in two different places just on that home page. And this is a very important characteristic of most of these serverless offers, offers is they're stateless. You can run code on them, but if you want to have like a database with stuff that changes, that's going to cost you extra. That's a whole new level of complexity, um, which if you can avoid it, these things uh, can get really interesting. So one of the questions that, what, one of the techniques that I've been experimenting with a lot over the past couple of years is, okay, if I can't have a regular database, what about if I ship static data as part of the application itself? We're dealing with Docker containers. What if my Docker containers got a bunch of data inside it already? And um, it turns out the SQLite database is the perfect tool for, that, for bundling up data and shipping it with the rest of your code. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk about some of the use cases for this. Like, how is a web app that doesn't accept writes at all, how is that an interesting thing? And for that, I'm diving back, I'll dive back into my own sort of career history and talk a little bit about data journalism. So data journalism is when programmers work for newspapers and help analyze the data and, and, and discover facts about the world through data analysis. It's a really exciting field. And I was lucky enough to get to do this um, uh, back in 2008 through 2010 at The Guardian in London. And so when I joined The Guardian, um, they had this fantastic onboarding scheme where you get to have coffee with random people from around the, the company. And I was sort of expressing my interest in data stuff. And a bunch of people said I needed to talk to a, a journalist called Simon Rogers. And Simon was the journalist, in, the person in the newsroom responsible for the data behind the infographics. If a newspaper publishes a map or a chart or a graph, they'd better have good numbers behind it. And so Simon was a dab hand with Excel, and he knew who to call to get data about basically anything you could think of. And I got kind of excited talking to him. I said, OK, so what do you do with all of these, these data sets that you've collected? And he said, oh, they're on here, pointing at the desktop underneath his, underneath his desk, which had hundreds of beautifully categorized Excel spreadsheets describing all sorts of facts about the world. So we started scheming together about how we could best publish this data online, get, like, share this data and let people derive their own insights from it. And in the end, we went with the simplest thing that could possibly work, which is a blog. We, start, um, we started the Guardian data blog, um, and when the Guardian published a story against data, they'd publish a spreadsheet of the underlying numbers. And the tool, tool we chose for publishing the data itself was Google Spreadsheets. Again, easiest thing that could possibly work. It didn't cost anything, and we, we, you can publish data in it. Now, this worked. It worked fantastically well. The Guardian actually built up a community of people around this data blog who would do their own visualizations of data that were published in Guardian Stories. But I was always left a little bit frustrated by this. It's like, is Google Sheets really the best possible way to be sharing data with the world? And so time passed, and I transitioned out of data journalism into startup things and kind of lost, lost connection with that world. But then a year and a half ago, I was thinking about this, and I realized that the, 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 in, the, the, um, the technologies that you would need to do a better job of this data publishing were now openly available. Um, 
And so I started building this open source project called Dataset. Um, I describe it as a tool for exploring and publishing data, but basically it's the thing I wish I'd had when I was at The Guardian working on these um, data journalism stories. And Dataset is best illustrated with a demo. So I'll show you, I'll show, get, try, try and give you an idea of some of its capabilities. Now, 538 are a blog that is basically data journalism through and through. Every story they publish is based on top of a data set. And if you look closely at their stories, you'll get, see there's this fascinating link that says, get the data on GitHub. If you click through to that, they've got this giant GitHub repository full of CSV files. And so this is a story about the number of um, uh, charges and convictions that came out of the, um, the, the recent Russia investigation compared to Watergate and a whole bunch of other things. So this is a 195 lines of CSV data on GitHub. And what I've been doing is I set up a Travis CI automation job, which once a day grabs everything from 538, like 450 odd CSV files, converts it into SQLite, and then hosts it under my dataset project um, up online. So I'll actually pull up a demo and show you what that looks like. This is, um, this is tethered off my mobile phone, so I'm hoping this works well. Um, so this is um, every data set the 538 have um, created converted to run under my data set um, application. And if I click through to this Russia investigation CSV, here's that raw data, but I can start doing interesting things. Like I can say, you know what, show me this by the current American president. So there were 20 charges when Ronald Reagan was president, 72 for Nixon, 45 for Clinton. I can say, show me the type of charge, like was it a guilty plea, an indictment, or a conviction? And then I can start digging in and say, okay, well, under Bill Clinton, there were... Um, 18 guilty pleas, and those 18 guilty pleas were these people, and I can say, show me the investigation, and this was um, 11 for Whitewater, 4 for Cisneros, and 3 for, e for eSpy, I guess? But you get the idea. This started life as a CSV file on 538. With zero configuration at all, I converted that into a SQLite database, and then Dataset is providing this interface over the top of it. But I promised you APIs in my talk title. That was my, my other, one of my other buzzwords. Um, if you click on JSON here, you get the same data that we were just looking at back as JSON. And in fact, you can also get it back as CSV. You can, um, this is quite fun. This, is, uh, this means you can slice and dice your data in any way that you like and then get back CSV subsets of just the things that you're interested in. And um, because this is running on top of SQLite, and SQLite is a SQL database, there's a link here that says View and Edit SQL. And if I click that, I get this interface, which is actually showing me the underlying SQL query that was run to generate that page. And I can even edit it. So I can say, you know what, I just want investigation, comma, name from blah de blah de blah And now I'm getting back that subset of data, which I can also get back as JSON or as CSV. This seems kind of insane because everyone knows you don't allow random people to run SQL against your data. But um, there are two things in this favor. Firstly, this is all public data. It's not like they're going to select my password file. And secondly, SQLite allows you to open files in read-only mode. So if you tried to do an insert or an update, it just won't work. It'll be rejected. So these are read-only SQL queries. I've put a one-second time limit on them, too. So if you try and do something crazy expensive, you'll just get an error after a second. And it means it's... Surpri it's shockingly enough, it's safe to expose data with SQL as your, um, as your query language and make that available through, through an API. A really fun detail here, if you look at the JSON URL here, you can see it's something.json question mark SQL equals, and I'm literally passing a SQL statement in as a parameter. People get really excited about GraphQL these days because GraphQL lets you, um, lets you specify exactly one. SQL's GraphQL from the 70s, right? It, it turns out it works great. So, <laughs> so, there are a whole bunch of handy features. You've got filtering and faceting, so you have that interface where you can facet by different columns. You can filter by things where something is greater than something else. You can run these custom SQL queries, and you've got this JSON API on top of everything that it does. And really, the secret source to this whole project is SQLite. Right? SQLite is this amazing little public domain licensed database. It's absolutely tiny. It's an embedded library which everyone in this room has access to because it ships as part of the Python standard library. Um, but it turns out it's ubiquitous to the point that um, it's in mobile phones, it's in desktops. My Apple Watch has a SQLite database on it that co records my steps, and which I haven't managed to get access to yet, which is really infuriating. Um, 
And one of the l nicest characteristics of SQLite is everything is a single database file, which means you can back it up by copying it somewhere. You can email them to people. It's a really nice archival format for all kinds, of, for any piece of data that will fit in a relational database, which is everything. Um, the catch is SQLite famously doesn't scale well for writes. That's why you wouldn't build a like, high traffic, um, uh, like interactive website with it. But we're not dealing with writes. If our data is read only, the one limitation of SQLite just disappears. And if you want to scale to handle millions of hits a second, run 30, 30 copies of the SQLite database and load balance between them. That's going to work just fine. So what this lets you do is it lets you ship both the data and the code in the same Docker container or in the same environment, which means all of these serverless platforms are suddenly available for you to do all kinds of exciting things with them. So I'll show you um, another demo to sort of illustrate quite how ubiquitous SQLite is. Um, dataset is Python 3 only, I think in 2019. That's not even something I need to mention anymore. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command which searches my hard drive. Um, this is going to search my library folder on my hard drive for any file ending in star.sqlite. So it's a find command looking for name star.sqlite, and then I'm going to sort them by with the biggest first. So hang on, let's run that again. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Here we go. This is the largest SQLite file in my, that my computer has is this mystery file called CLS Business Category Cache.sqlite. It's something to do with Apple Photo Analysis D. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run Dataset against it. So Dataset, once you've installed it, it's a command line tool. You can give it a port because I'm thinking I'm already using the port it normally runs on, and I'm going to give it the path to that file, and it's going to start up. And now if I visit this URL, here is that database. This is now me browsing this, um, this mystery database that I found on my computer. It's got 189,000 rows in Z business item. Um, they've got Z latitude and Z longitude, which is suspicious. Um, so one of the things Dataset does is it has plugin support. So you can write plugins for it. And one of the plugins I wrote is one which says, if there's a latitude and longitude column, render them on a map. Now, this isn't latitude and longitude. This is Z latitude and Z longitude. So I'm going to do select Z latitude as latitude, comma, Z longitude as longitude, comma, star from this. Um, and I'm going to get rid of the limit and hit run SQL. And so this is kind of creepy, because these are places that I have been in the last, last couple of years. I've been to South America, London, the East Coast, the West Coast, and Mexico City. And in fact, if I order by this descending, it'll show me the most recent places I've been, um, presumably. Um, so I've been in San Francisco, and oh, look, Cleveland. This is, um, interest, Siri seems to have cut in. So this is, this is kind of fascinating. There is a database on my computer containing all kinds of locations that I have been recently. And so I searched Google for CLS business category cache, and I got two hits, one of which was from the, the computer forensics subreddit, where somebody's saying, does anyone know what this thing is? And if you zoom in, it says, one of the GPS coordinates is the crime scene. And to my utter frustration, there's no follow-ups on this. This is all I've got to go on. So. <laughs> I don't think anyone even replied with anything useful. So there's a mystery for you. Like, I, I, I can't tell you any more than that, but it's, it's a fascinating thing I found by digging through my, desk, my, my laptop looking for SQLite databases. So that SQLite databases, turns out they're everywhere already. The thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to create new ones. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of the tools I've been working on that help, help create SQLite databases. And the first one is a tool called CSVs to SQLite. And the reason I created this is about 10 years ago, um, a whole bunch of people were really campaigning for open data from governments. You know, we were saying, hey, governments, you've got all this amazing data. We, the taxpayers, have paid for you to collect it. You should release it somewhere. And to my utter surprise, it worked. This is a map of open data portals around the world. And this is from like a year ago, and there were 2,600 of them crossing like basically every country. And when you actually start digging into this, it's amazing what you can find. Um, the city of San Francisco publishes a CSV file of every tree in the city, which is 190,000 rows of trees, each with a latitude and longitude. 
Um, I found parking meters um, data from a tiny little town in Morocco. There's all of this amazing stuff out there. And the standard format that people are publishing this stuff in is, is CSV, which is it's good in that we can work with CSV. It's bad in that it's easy to mess up your CSV files and get escaping and such like wrong. So for today, I thought I'd have a quick look at what's available around the state of Ohio and Cleveland. Ohio, I have to admit, is not great at open data. Um, like San Francisco has 400 CSV files for the one city. Ohio is a little bit further behind that, but I did find this file, which is interesting. This is the state properties. It's properties owned by the state of Ohio, and it's a CSV file, um, which you can download from that website. And luckily, it has, it has those latitude and longitude columns in it. So let's actually, hang on, let's hit this thing up. Um, so I've got a file, oh, wrong folder. Um, Dropbox presentations, PyCon, oh, 2019, PyCon. Okay, so here's one I downloaded earlier, SORP2012.csv. So I'm gonna do CSVs to SQLite that and I'm gonna call it ohio.db. So, dumpf, it's created ohio.db, and now if I run data set on another random port, ohio.db. Here we are, diving straight into that data. Um, oh, again, we've got lon and lat. Um, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm actually going to edit that file. What was that file called? Um, in fact, you know what? I'm gonna switch to a more exciting way of working with this. So there's this amazing product called Glitch, which is a um, sort of learn to program environment with live recoding and the ability to remix other people's projects. And it's a very interesting thing. And I built something a couple of weeks ago on it called Dataset CSVs, which is a demonstration of how to use datasets and CSVs to SQLite to convert CSV files and host them online. So if, you, if anyone goes to glitch.com slash tilde dataset hyphen CSVs, you can click on remix this to create your own copy of my project and start editing it. Glitch has a text editor in your browser. It's running a, a container with your code in and it's automatically previewing your code in here. So this is a live code environment where I can start editing things. And as this readme says, you can drag and drop a CSV file into this project and it will be converted into a SQLite database. So let's see, where did we put, here's that SRP thing. I'm gonna drag and drop it in here. So now we've got SORP2012.csv. And then the edit I was about to make in my editor, I'm gonna find the lo longitude and latitude col l columns and rename them. So that one I'm gonna call longitude, and that one I'm gonna call latitude. And note that this right-hand pane is already showing that data. This right here is, oh, there we go. This right here, is that CSV file running inside of dataset? Um, but with those two changes uh, made, so longitude and latitude are running there. And this is all powered by a file called glitch.json, which knows that to install, it has to pip install dataset and CSVs to SQLite, SQLite and then run them. And then it has to start, it has to run the dataset server. And I actually want to add an extra thing to this. I'm gonna install that plugin, the cluster map one. So I'm gonna say pip install dataset cluster map. There we go, and there's a little uh, log file here that will show what it's actually doing. So it's already done it. It's installed that new library, it's loaded up here, and now if I click on this thing here, I've got a map. Um, let's do show in a new window. This is a file, this is a URL right now that anyone can go and visit, and this is a map of all of the 36,000 buildings owned by the state of Ohio. If I click the load all button, did I click that successfully? Um, it's actually going to load all 36,000 points onto the map because it turns out JavaScript's kind of fast now. Um, so yeah, this is loading up, and this is now a interactive map of every property owned by the state of Ohio, and literally all I had to do for, to, to get this was download that CSV file, drag it into a window, and here it is. I think this is a really, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by Glitch as a sort of tool for rapidly prototyping things. I think it's, and part of, my, part of my goal with this project is to make this kind of tooling more accessible to journalists. This is a pretty exciting way of getting journalists to, um, giving journalists the ability to start messing around with code and with these kinds of projects without having to completely talk them through how to program. 
So, um, did that map finish loading? There we go, this is um, oh, 24,000. Oh, it's, it's loading over my phone. That would explain why it's taking a while to load 36,000 data points. Um, but anyway, you can see this is, um, these are, oh, it's gonna zoom in and out while it's loading. I'll come back to that one later. So, that's an example of um, using the CSVs to SQLite command to convert open data released by government, and then using Glitch to actually host that data and start interacting with it, installing plugins, playing out with this whole ecosystem. Amazingly, Glitch doesn't even require you to have a login. If you, in a, if you without logging into the site, go to my project and click that remix button, it'll give you an anonymous session and give you a project that will get deleted in five days' time, but it's still enough for you to start playing around and trying out the tools. But let's talk about a slightly more sophisticated example. Because um, CSVs to SQLite works great if your data is a CSV file, but a lot of, a lot of times you want to, do, want to pull data from multiple sources and do something a little bit more comprehensive with it before you start trying to serve it up. So I've been working on a library called SQLite Utils, which is mainly designed for running in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I'm a huge fan of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, if you're doing ad hoc data analysis, screen scraping, and so forth, they're a fantastic environment. And so what I'm gonna do is show you, talk you through how I built, how, how I, how I built a database of the most popular PyPI packages using that Jupyter Notebook and this library. So I'm gonna jump over to that now. Again, this will be fun watching it work over my phone, but I think, it's, I think it'll be okay. Okay, so is that readable? There we go. So there is a fabulous project run by, who, oh, what happened there? Um, I lost track of who built this, but um, this project here is um, running a Google BigQuery once a week to figure out the 5,000 most downloaded packages from the Python package index. And hand handily, it makes all of that data available as a JSON file. So if you want to start interrogating, um, interrogating uh, like Python statistics, this is a really good starting point. And in that JSON file, you basically get a list of projects and their download count. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use the requests library to fetch that back in. I'm gonna pull out just the top 100 to speed things up a little bit and print them all out. So here we have the top 100 Python, um, downloaded packages from PyPI over the past, um, which one did I use? Over the past 365 days. And PIP itself has been down downloaded 531 million times, which is an interesting number in itself. So now that I've done that, I'd like to get a little bit more information about each of those packages. And it turns out um, PyPI has this semi-documented feature where if you go to um, PyPI slash Django, you get the information about Django, and if you add slash JSON on the end, it'll give you the key information about that package. It, oh, what happened there? Oh, PyPI slash Django, so it'll give you the key information in that package as JSON, and you can pretty print that out and see, okay, we're getting back the author, the author email, the classifiers, the description, it's a, it's a good amount of data. So again, because I'm on my phone, I'm just gonna do this with the top 10 packages. Um, I'm going to loop through the top 10 packages and for each one, request that URL, annotate it with the download count, because that's not available on PyPI, but it is available from our original data source, and stick that in a list of records. So, shift, enter, here we go. So, oh, that's fine pretty quickly. There we have the top 10 packages. Um, there's 10 things in my records array. Um, if we look at the first item in the records array, it's as you would expect, it's a JSON blob. And so now this gets fun because what I want to do is turn this into a database, so that in a, into a SQLite database, so I can start exploring it with data set. And so to do that, I'm gonna import the SQLite utils module. I'm gonna do db equals SQLite utils dot database and give it the path to a file. I'm actually just gonna make sure I haven't got that file already. Um, okay, I'm gonna remove that file first to make sure this works. So I do this, and then I can say db packages. Um, this is a table that I'm about to create. I'm gonna create a table called packages. Dot insert all. I'm gonna send it that list of records. I could stop then, and that would create me a database table, but I want to do a couple of other things. I want to say the primary key should be that name column. Um, 
which is the, the name of the package, which on PyPI we can guarantee is unique. And I'm also gonna give it a column order because without that, the columns will be in a random order. And if I say, you know what, I want the name and the summary and the download count first, it'll be a little bit nicer to look at. So I'll do that and that's created the table. And then the last step, I'm gonna tell it I want to enable full text search across the name, summary, keywords, and description columns. So that's it, that's done. Now if we look in here again, we have a file called pypi.db. It's 140 kilobytes, because it's only got 10 things in it. And I can run dataset dash p, um, I run out of ports a lot, um, pipi.db, and here we go. This is a database of Python packages. A couple of interesting things about this. Um, firstly, we can order by download count, and there's pip sitting at the top. Um, if you look at the classifiers uh, column here, you'll notice that this is an array. That's because the data, in, it was actually a nested JSON array in that data we pulled back. SQLite util spots when that happens, and it creates a serialized JSON blob in that particular column, which is handy because SQLite, it's, SQLite actually has JSON functions built in. So you can run SQL queries against the contents of a JSON array and do all sorts of interesting things with that structured data once it makes in there. And this is super convenient if you're working with if you just want to grab some data and get it into a shape where you can start looking at it, because you don't have to think about the fact that some of it's JSON that's just handled automatically for you. Um, and again, we can facet. We can see that Amazon Web Services have two of the packages in the top 10. That's Boto Core and S3 Transfer, uh, two of the top 10 downloaded loaded packages. What I'm actually going to do is um, I prepared, before this talk, I prepared a more interesting database Actually, well, before this talk, I downloaded um, the first, the top 1,500 packages. So what I'll do is I'm going to load those in. This is um, 1,500 packages in the same format as those 10 that I just pulled down. And now I'm going to add them to that database again. Um, here I'm get, rather than doing an insert, I'm doing an upsert. So this is saying insert these records. If the primary key of name clashes with an existing record, replace that existing record. Um, so I can do that, and I'm also saying I want to populate the full text search, which I'll show you in a moment. So that should have worked. Um, I'm gonna run dataset again. And so now, I should have, here we go, this is now 1,500 Python packages. You'll notice everything is super fast because 1,500 is not a lot of data, and SQLite is an incredibly optimized piece of software. Um, the, there's an interesting thing here where dataset suggests fields that you might want to facet on based on which of the fields, which columns available have less than 20 unique values. Um, and right now, across 1,500 packages, the only one with less than 20 unique values is the description content type. So we can see Markdown is currently beating rest restructured text. Um, but you can actually hack around in the URL. So if I say facet equals author in the URL itself, it'll show me the top authors. Microsoft Corporation are responsible for 149 of the packages in the top um, top 1500 on PyPI, which is kind of fascinating. Google have Google LLC, Google Inc, and Google Inc dots. They need to standardize their names a bit. In terms of individuals, I'm sure people won't be surprised to see that Kenneth Reitz has the most packages in the top 1500 that aren't authored by a corporation. But this is kind of cool, right? We're getting insight into those top 1500, and we've put very little work in. There were what, a dozen lines of Python code in a Jupyter notebook to create this thing, and now I'm able to start exploring that data. I'm gonna do something a little bit more exciting than that. Um, let's publish it to the internet. So, dataset has a bunch of subcommands, dataset dash dash help will show you what those commands are. The most exciting of which is dataset publish. So, dataset publish lets you take a CSV file and stick it on the internet, and actually, I need to switch to my development version of dataset for this. Um, dataset dash dash help. Dataset publish dash dash. So as of yesterday morning, dataset can now publish to Google Cloud Run. Previously, it, pub it, it, it could only do Zite Now and Heroku. And that's, um, and the best part of our open source is that's nothing to do with me at all. That was written by, um, that's a uh, pull request I just merged from Romain Primet. So thank you very much, Romain, for, for, for implementing that feature. But that means I can run dataset publish cloud run. And I have no idea if this is gonna work over, the, over my telephone, so we'll see. 
Um, I can pass it a bunch of arguments. I'm going to tell it I want the title of my published data set to be PyPI top 1500 packages. I want to install a plugin. Um, data set Vega is a visualization plugin. I'm going to use master, the master branch. So rather than the version of data set from PyPI, I'm actually going to use the latest version from GitHub. And I'm going to enable cause headers so that I can do JSON API calls to it from other places. And let's see what happens. I'm excited to see if this works. Here we go. We'll leave this running in the background for a little bit. Thankfully, I've got one of these I prepared earlier. So there we go. It's kicked off. It's creating a tarball. The tarball is 12.9 megabytes because it's a Docker file, and it's that SQLite database. We're, we're packaging the data with the thing. We send that up to Google Cloud Build, which will then build that Docker container. That upload is going to take a little while. But eventually, we'll start, start seeing it spit out a whole bunch of um, output of building the Docker file, publishing it to their um, image storage, and eventually launching a new instance wh which we can actually go and browse. So let's see what that's going to be like um, right now. Here we go. This is, unfortunately, Cloud Run gives us quite ugly URLs. But what it will give us is this. I haven't hit the, there we go. Oh, that's a bug in the, in the latest master that I need to fix. Um, PyPI, here we go. So here's the, here's that database, just as we saw earlier, but this is up published on the internet. Um, and because I installed the dataset Vega plugin, I also get the uh, option to do charts. So I can say, you know what, I want a bar chart where I'm going to take the name of the plugin and I'm going to plot it against the download count. And uh, let's swap x and y coordinates so that we can see it more easily. And then you can also say, you know what, I want the color to correspond to, let's do the license. Is license in there? Dun -ba -dun -ba -dun. There we go. So now we're seeing that. Um, so now we've got a graph of the downloads of the top 100 in this case. Um, we're color coded against the licenses. And this is something I'm really excited in digging into further, the idea that plugins can add visualizations or all kinds of other additional functionality on top of the, the core data set um, tool. So let's see if that's, oh, look at that. It worked. That, that's amazing. My, my telephone just deployed a web app. Um, that's really cool. And yeah, if I double click here, I get that error, which I will have to fix after, after this talk. But there's that database. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got a JSON API. So now anyone in the world can start building their own tools against a JSON API of the top 1,500 Python packages with a whole bunch of useful things. Something I forgot to demonstrate earlier is um, I enabled full text search against a bunch of columns. This means that if I search for, say, Django, it'll return all of the packages that match Django. Um, I can search for Ginger. Oh, Ginger. So Ginger didn't give me the right result because it's stored as Ginger2. You can actually use wildcards in this. So if I do Ginger with a star, then I think I'll get back Ginger2 as one of those results. So we've now got full text search running against four columns in a database. And the amount of effort taken to put this together and publish it online was, was, was very, very small, which is really what this whole project is about. It's like, how can we take any data set you can imagine and get it online in the most useful um, way possible with, with the least effort and cost? So let's. Let's build something even more fun. So we've got this JSON API. What can we build on top of it? And again, I'm going to return to Glitch for this um, because Glitch is such a great rapid prototyping environment. Um, so what we've got here is an autocomplete search engine running against PyPI. If I start typing Django, uh, there we go. It's, it's returning results. I can do AWS and Inter troposphere comes back. Oh, and this is kind of giving us a clue as to why we're getting different results come back at the top. The, um, it's a straightforward, um, what's it called, TFIDF style search. So AWS is mentioned, it turns out, 50 times in the description of this thing because it's got all of these different resource um, supports and so forth. But the implementation of this is kind of fun. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'll show you this in the data set SQL environment first. Um, so what I've actually done here is I've composed a custom SQL query for the feature that we want to build. So I'm saying select packages.rank, packages name, packages summary from packages, join packages FTS, where packages FTS match search. This is how SQLite's built-in search engine works. It creates a 
second table called the name of your table underscore FTS, and it lets you then join against that table to run full text search commands. Uh, another fun detail here is because I've got colon search in my search query, uh, in my SQL query, data set smart enough to spot that and pull it out and turn it into a form field. So here I've got a quick interface for starting to play around with this, um, with this, uh, with, with this SQL query. Really neat detail here is it means you can build entirely new applications by writing some SQL and then sending the link to somebody else. I can literally paste this link into an email, and if somebody clicks on it, they'll be able to start interacting with whatever SQL query it is I just came up with. So, oh, so there's that query. I click get as JSON, and I'm getting it back as JSON data. And so if we look at the um, autocomplete implementation here, this is an HTML file with a little bit of JavaScript in it, and that JavaScript literally assembles SQL in a JavaScript um, a backtick string, which is the JavaScript equivalent of, of, um, of, of F strings. I love this. I, I, I think there's something it's very subversive about embedding SQL directly in JavaScript. I've been trying to upset people at work with this quite a bit. Um, but it works, right? And so this is um, assembling that. I'm adding a little bit of code to do the sort of syntax highlighting. I've got a on key up on the search box, which runs the searches. This is entirely like raw, um, like uh, vanilla JavaScript. There's no libraries or anything in here. All of the work is done by a fetch. I do a fetch against that URL, and then I decode the JSON, and then I use inner HTML to create the search results. Literally, this entire thing is, what, 100 lines of code, and that's the full implementation for a very snappy autocomplete. You know, this is, the performance you get from this is pretty decent considering um, partly because it's SQLite on the server, partly because there's very little bytes on the wire for this. I've been having a lot of fun building all kinds of um, like little prototypes like this, because once you've got SQL in your JavaScript, it turns out you can knock out some really exciting, complex projects with very little um, invested effort. So, and um, I've got an uh, article I wrote um, in December that more or less describes this technique in more detail if you want to really get into the guts of how all of that worked. So I wanted to show you a few other interesting projects that, um, that myself and other people have built on top of Dataset. Um, the first one, this is um, some sort of freelance data journalism I did last August. Um, so the Russian IRA, the Internet Research Agency, are this mysterious group in Russia who've been buying Facebook ads to promote various um, political causes. And um, the House Intelligence Committee uh, got hold of all of the ads that they had placed um, and then made them available for people to download, which is super exciting, except they made them available as a bunch of zip files of um, zipped up PDF files, which is not quite so exciting. But this chap called Ed, Ed Summers took those PDF files, wrote some genius code on top of um, Tesseract OCR, and turned them all into JSON. And actually, you know what, I'll, I'll show you his project for this just quickly, because it's kind of amazing. Um, here we go. He, has a GitHub repository, which you should check out. It uses Tesseract OCR, takes those PDFs, and turns them into a beautifully constructed set of, um, of, uh, set of, uh, set of JSON. So I took that JSON, and I used it to build a data set instance that lets you search through the ads that the Russians were placing. And so let's search for cops as an example. If I search for the word cops, I get back these are ads that the Russians paid for in COPS. I can sort by the amount of US dollars that they spent on this. Um, so they spent $215 on this ad here, but you also get the targeting information from Facebook. So they were targeting this at people who are age 18 to 65. That one's not particularly exciting, but the really creepy stuff is when you look at things like the most frequent targets that they were going after, and it's people who match interests, Martin, Martin Luther King, African-American history and so forth. The Russians were deliberately targeting the African-American voting segment with all kinds of messaging. Um, it's kind of fascinating to, to like, dig into this data, but it's also, this is exactly the kind of thing I want data sets to be used for, is taking these initially sort of obtuse binary blobs of PDF files and then turning them to an interactive experience where people can actually start diving through and, 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 and investigating that data themselves. Uh, the other project I wanted to show you is um, I built Dataset hoping that newspapers would use it. 
at least one newspaper has. This is the Baltimore Sun. Um, Carl Johnson at the Baltimore Sun used it to publish the salary information of, the, um, of everyone employed by the state of, Mar of Maryland. And so you can see the, um, this one's quite fun, you can see the highest paid person for each organizer. People will not be surprised to see that the football coach at the University of Maryland is the highest paid person in the entire state by, by the state government. Um, but this is great, right? This is a newspaper used by software. They, they used the theming and the templates to put their own um, like color scheme and interface on the top, and they used it to publish data of interest to the public. And I believe they're hosting this entire thing on a T2 micro, because it turns out Python and SQLite, like SQLite runs on a watch. It doesn't need a lot of resources to produce really good results. So I'm going to move to questions in a second, but I, th I have a call to action first, which is that it turns out the world is completely full of interesting data. I want people to publish it in the most useful way possible. So if you have data, please take a look at data set. If you're interested in... Um, in working, in, in working with me on this open source project, I'm very keen on getting more plugins, getting more publishing options to different hosting providers. I'm trying to figure out um, a, a Amazon Lambda at the moment, which is difficult because they decided that, Py that SQLite was not a useful module and didn't include it in their Python distribution. But um, there's a lot of scope, I think, for, for, for developing this project in all kinds of interesting ways. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Simon. We have about five minutes left for questions, so if anyone would like to have a question, please come up to a mic, and we'll be able to get that started. You stated early on that, um, oh, first of all, thank you so very much. This was very enlightening for um, what to, you can do with data. Uh, early on, you, you stated that because um, uh, of your description of serverless as it can scale to zero, mm -hmm. and SQL, SQLite being read-only in read-only mode eliminates the problems right. that it comes with. You can um, you can inherently scale that as well. Uh, how is um, data set deploy shipping the databases with it? Are, are you shipping to two different areas that can scale on their own? Or no, is not it at all. I'm literally I create a, a Docker container with the data set app in it and the SQLite database just in the container, and, and I ship that. And that's been working really well. It has size constraints. You know, Once you get to like a two gigabyte um, SQLite database, that's a Docker container which is not gonna boot up very quickly. So I'm very interested in looking at um, providers that let you mount a persistent volume just so I can store a two gigabyte database and not have to worry about it. But the, the technical size limit of SQLite is 140 terabytes, so I'm not expecting to run into any constraints on that, that anytime soon. Anyone else question? I guess that's it for now. Oh, thank so. you.